The Practical People is brought to you by... thought she'd found something in one of her books that lined up with her research. She put them together, and then she told me she talked to someone from another dimension. Yeah. All I'm going to do is bring my sister. Be very careful with Jacob Colt. Where are we? I can't see a goddamn oh, thing. we're definitely still down the rabbit hole. Good evening, good morning, whatever time you're listening. Welcome to another episode of The Practical People. I am your host, Christopher Moonlight, and I am joined today by a, a wonderful co-host. She <laughs> is the uh, effects artist on uh, my movie, The Quantum Terror. Uh, she's also done a lot of other independent features and uh, was on season four of Sci-Fi's Face off, a very good friend of mine, Miss Jenna Green. How are you doing today, Jenna? I'm doing very well. Hi, everyone. How are you doing? Thanks for joining us today. <laughs> so uh, I'm I'm also really excited because this is this is the face off episode. Um, I am very privileged to have a man who is a, a rather brilliant concept designer. You know his work from Star Trek and uh, one of my favorite recent sci-fi movies, Prometheus, as well as Avatar. Uh, he's no slouch, and uh, <laughs> no. he he also shares a uh, name with one of my favorite vampire killers, uh, Mr. <laughs> Neville Page. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So, uh, yeah, we wanted to, we always like to start out with a, a current event, and there's one that I'm pretty excited about. Uh, I know a lot of people have mixed feelings about it, but it is uh, they are they're working on Indiana Jones five. It's it's been kind of in the works for a while, but we're we're hearing details of it. Uh, are you ready for Indy five? I am. You know, it, it, I, I like any reboot. I like any remake. I always find it interesting when people get so upset that another film is being either remade or a sequel is being done. And it fascinates me why it's so upsetting to people, because when you think about Shakespeare's works, and I'm not comparing Indiana Jones to Shakespeare, but what I, I think that everything deserves a chance, and we should all reserve uh, a strong opinion until you experience it. So, yeah, the previous Indiana Jones was not everyone's favorite. Uh, but I'm excited to see what this one is because you just never know. What about you, Jenna? Are you a big indie fan? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm a huge indie fan. <laughs> I remember waiting in line for hours and hours to get into the movie theater to see it. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I, I, I have to, I, I understand where Neville's uh, coming from, and it's actually really interesting to hear that Shakespeare point of view because. There are times when I'm like, no, please don't remake it. It's so perfect as it is because everybody mm -hmm. has that fear that it's going to be ruined. But you're right. Shakespeare, Shakespearean works are evident in so many in, in mainstream movies through the years. It's the same story. It just has a different name. So, um, so it is re Shakespeare works are remade constantly under a different movie like you could look at a movie and like well that's the same story as Romeo and Juliet however it's not called Romeo and, Ju Romeo yeah, and Juliet yeah. so I get what you're saying and that's a really interesting way to, to look at it um, one of my favorite uh, sci-fi movies Forbidden Planet is based on Shakespeare's The Tempest so yeah. I get mm -hmm. from there I, I have to you know one of my favorite indie movies out of the well I love them all but 
I have a soft spot for Temple of Doom, and that was kind of panned by the critics as well. But I thought that that was some of the most fun storytelling, some great heroic moments, and I it thought was definitely dark too. Well, I thought yeah. John Williams' score really, uh, God, he went to town on that, and I, I just, I, I still feel that kind of emotional kind of surge in my chest when I hear the the music from Temple of Doom. I think it was really great. Um, so I don't, I don't. I want to speculate. I, you you don't have any inside, do you, on uh, what mm-hmm. what the um, uh, the plot? You don't hear anything about what the plot might be or anything <laughs> like that. You, I have so little insight that you telling me they're doing another Indiana Jones is the first I've heard of it. So <laughs> I'm pretty clueless. I will say, <laughs> if I ever got a chance to write the script for the fifth one, I would explain exactly why Indy survived that fridge nuking experience and uh yes yeah. that needs to be explored a lot i think i think that there's something that ties all the movies together and make it come full circle um in my mind didn't mythbusters do a thing on that whole refrigerator thing i, I thought i saw I something online i think you're right about that yeah, yeah which is you know that, that's the danger of when we design stuff uh, it's the danger and the delight of when we design stuff for film and television is that at some point someone's going to call you out on your choices. So it kind of uh, demands that we make <laughs> good choices because it's it's going to be it's going to be scrutinized at some point. You know, we're we're undergoing this right now with the new Star Trek Discovery TV show. Yeah. That's talk about it being uh, heavily heavily scrutinized. scrutinized. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's cool. You're going up a, a, against a lot of fans who are, you know, they've pretty much, I mean, they've dedicated their lives to, uh, you know, making sure that all the continuity makes sense and that, you know, this, you know, and, and you have to try new things. I mean, after 50 years of Star Trek, there's, you know, you've got to try and take it in different directions. You, you do, and then you shouldn't, but you're obligated to. It's a, you know, it comes down to you cannot satisfy everyone, and once you try to do that, you establish uh, beautiful mediocrity. It's kind of a weird and economy, it, right? It is. Yeah. It is. It, you know, it, I, I I struggle with it every day designing stuff for this new series, and having worked with JJ on his Star Treks, you have to be uh, mindful of the canon that's been established by the writers and creators of the show. But they only did so much work, and then the audience, the fans, they filled in the ginormous gaps because of their passion and and interest in figuring out backstory of characters and backstory of the Klingons. So it's kind of like who's actually writing, creating the show, who owns it um, conceptually. And because of the, the success of all Star Treks and how long it's been around, it's almost a public domain in terms of ownership. And I, I rarely say that because when I hear people complain about, oh, you're ruining my movie, I often think it's not your movie. I get it. I'm passionate about these movies as well, and it's a bummer when they don't turn out the way you'd like. But it's not yours, and at the very end, you got to appreciate the fact that it's a business, and these are things that are being created for the most part, especially the big ones that are millions of dollars. they got to get a return on their investment. So it's a business, um, almost first and foremost, but then you try as best you can as an artist to keep it artistic and keep it honest to its, its roots. I think that, you know, it's a, you bring up two really good points. One is, you know, the fact that it's a business, you have to satisfy both fans and people who are not necessarily fans, but maybe the, the newer generation or, or people who are not necessarily sci-fi fans, but they're going to show up and then the other thing that you bring up which is a big reason why I wanted to have you on the show is is that fan scrutiny because as a uh, a judge on sci-fi's face off you are you're you're kind of a combination of things on that show because you're 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 judging their work but you're also judging it in a a contest capacity, not a uh, an actual um, studio uh, workshop setting, 
But you're also, you know, and this is one of the things I really love about Face Off, and I've, I've watched all the seasons, and I watch it with my family. My girls love it. Um, you know, you, you kind of are also, it, it's not a high drama show in the sense that, you know, they're, people's dreams are getting crushed or anything like that. You guys have kind of very much take on a mentor role as well. And uh, I see on social media, you, you get defensive of them when the fans kind of attack them. And I, I'd like to know a little bit of your perspective on, as someone who is uh, working with these, I want to say kids, they're not all kids, um, but, uh, <laughs> you know, they... Uh, you know, your, your perspective on them and how they're perceived on the show. Would you hit the nail on the head by talking about it being in the, um, what the scenario is, it has to be kept in mind. That's why it, the, the comments I made on Facebook recently about the context being a, an important thing about how you judge in life. You have to appreciate where that person is and what they're doing at that moment and uh, their access to tools and their access to education. And when you all of a sudden understand that, then you have, if invited, the, the right to respond. Uh, but it has to be done with um, uh, being compassionate and, and courteous because just simple human nature. I went to school. I had people critiquing my work. I work professionally. I have people critiquing my work. So I know what it is like. It's not as if uh, I don't understand what it's like to be on the other side of judging. And you know, whilst we are judges on Face Off, we are also currently working on productions and getting our ass handed to us as well by people that sometimes have a professional etiquette when they describe how they like or don't like your work. So it's ever present in my mind to do the best that I can as a mentor. There was never one of the job descriptions coming into Face Off. Uh, I know that they did say this isn't a, a show that's about um, drama. <clears throat> it's about celebrating the arts, which is great. Because quite honestly, I wouldn't have taken on the role as a judge if it was a drama show. And most people don't know this, nor should they have to know this, but I've been a teacher professionally for about 20 years. Uh, I haven't been teaching too much this last three years, ironically because of face-off. But I've been in the college world of um, education for people spending a lot of money, and it's a lot of students that come through my classroom. And not only did they purchase um, what should be a good educational experience, but they, they deserve the best that one can offer, but as a teacher, you have the obligation to understand that every single person is an individual and is at a certain level and, moreover, is receptive in their special, unique way to criticism, which I'm putting in quotes. So and it took me a while to learn how to be a good teacher slash good critiquer. Because you, you can't just go in with a blanket statement of, uh, look, you tr but you need to work on this and this and this. Not everyone understands it. Some people need to be told off to be motivated. Uh, some people need to be handled rather carefully. Uh, and you have to be very, um, very mindful of that in the criticism process. So I have no patience for people that jump into criticizing work starting off with negative. And I'm guilty of it, too. I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, if you're ever going to be a judge, please follow my lead. I've made mistakes. Jenny, you've probably seen me make mistakes on the show. Uh, I've done my best to try and maintain and sustain my point of view of being compassionate. Because, uh, you know, you have children, mm -hmm. Christopher, so you know that, uh, and you as well, Jenna, you, you know that yelling at your child first is going to shut down uh, the ability to kind of get in there and help involve them in the way that you feel is appropriate. So it is, it is manipulative, but in the most positive way, by saying something nice first 
and being sincere. That's also a critical part of this. You've got to be yeah. sincere about this. Um, but once you understand what it means to just be a good human being and you put effort into it, because it takes effort, uh, you know, not everyone, some people are just naturally good, uh, but it's just like manners. You're not born to say please and thank you. Mm-hmm. Your parents are the ones that say, hey, you know, it's in the social etiquette of this world. It is the best thing to do that when somebody opens a door, you say thank you. And most people today, I find, still don't say thank you when you open a door for them. So um, okay. that, that, that's sad. <laughs> but but the, the point being is that you have to learn how to be a good uh, I don't say learn. You have to practice and be open as to how to be a good parent, a good teacher, etc. So I've tried to do that on Face Off, of I course. I absolutely and it, did on my season, for sure. Mm-hmm. I appreciate that. Thank I've you. I've grown substantially just from, from that experience and from your, your judging and critique. So definitely. I could definitely well, thanks. say that's, well do- that's a job well done. <laughs> well, I, th- I know that there are probably some other contestants that would argue that, and I, I welcome that as well because... Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there are times, I remember at the beginning of the show, I was learning what the show needed, yeah. uh, what the, what the viewing public probably wanted. And those are the two things you got to be so careful of because yeah. you could quickly become not yourself. Yeah. And it's like, Oh, what, what, what do people want to hear? Yeah, like, what I'm should I say? You know? Mm-hmm. And then you, you quickly realize after a couple rounds of it, it's like, ah, it's too much work to predict and imagine what people would want to hear. To hell with that. Be genuine, be yourself, and, you know, it's, it's a metaphor for life, easily, to uh, be applied to everything. You just be yourself, and if people don't like you because of it, you have two choices. You basically say, hey, that's who I am, or... You embrace the potential that you might have room for growth, and there might be uh, uh, an opportunity to change, because we are not perfect. We are fallible. And I'm open to being uh, wrong. I I would say, you know, Face Off, I I watched it from the very first season. uh, I was instantly attracted to it um, when it, when it initially aired, and I do feel that it is a show that, it, one of the reasons I continue to watch it, it, it wasn't formulaic in the sense of, you know, it's going to be like these drama beats or something like that. It is a show that seemed like it found its way and grew into what we know now. And I'm not talking about the different, like, you know, you had the mentor challenge where contestants came back and, and uh, mentored a team. Or um, this season you have the um, uh, divide and conquer you know, those those are different themes to try, but I'm talking about the personality is, uh, you know, Mackenzie Westmore as a host and uh, Mr. Westmore as a mentor in the shop and you guys as judges on the table. It does seem like you guys really kind of found a rhythm that was probably born out of not trying to force it, but, but doing as you said. Yeah, it is. Again, I, I didn't want to be on a show that was... Uh, behind the scenes scripted mm-hmm. you know we wear earbuds <clears throat> and I think people know that and if you don't uh, it shouldn't be too much of a surprise the contestants I think know that we wear earbuds because there's sometimes we have a blank stare and we're talking off into space at what would seem like nothing mm-hmm. but we're hearing stuff from the producers it's technical we're never fed a line why don't you say this because that's going to agitate that contestant that is not at all what happens it's usually um we have a sound problem we got to redo that okay noted so i was very pleased to see that they lived up to the producers of the show they lived up to the uh to what they sold me and that was this is a show about creativity and it's an opportunity to elevate uh, people now granted there's a few times and maybe still currently where I might come in a little aggressive about something because I get I get passionate <laughs> which is also also a euphemism for upset um, but I get passionate about people doing uh, their best and living up to their potential so when people fall short you 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 know like a parent you get frustrated but what's interesting, and I've only just been sharing this with people recently because it's come up, 
I don't know if you, you probably know this now, Jenna, but we know nothing of what goes on behind the scenes. I don't know what the show is like until I watch it when it airs. So there are times when I'm watching the show and I remember I critique something either no too positive or, or ne- yeah i was really negative like god why did you do that why did and you are up there on stage because you don't have the chance to really engage in a big conversation there's not the time and then i watch it and it's like oh my gosh no you're such an ass i had no idea that that happened and there was this problem and the phone didn't work out oh well sorry but <laughs> that but what's good about that is i could say i'm making an excuse um for and apologizing for having been aggressive without knowing what happened, but that is a direct simile to how the professional world works. I don't get to go up to James Cameron and say, you know what happened? Yeah, the mold didn't work out, my, my, my sketch pad got wet. He not only should not care, <laughs> he should not be bothered with, you know, the dog ate my homework. It's just you, you, you own whatever it is, and that's one of the reasons why I'm very defensive of the contestants. Is and, uh, yeah, I kind of want to touch so on hard. something you mentioned earlier mm-hmm. too, and that was that you know you're you're always even like on in a professional spectrum on sets and in the workshop you get critiqued all the time. You get your ass handed to you, whatever the case is, and I think a lot of people don't necessarily realize that. Um, as, as contestants that have continued on and, and are working, every time I present something, I'm like, you know, you're always subject to critique um, and whether somebody's going to like it or not like it. And I think what some people don't realize is people like you who have been doing this forever with the skill level that you have, you still have that situation happen. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know? and, and people just think, oh, it's automatically awesome. And there's, you know, I think a lot of people just assume it's a done deal and you don't have to do things over again and whatever. So I, I think that's a really interesting thing um, to, to bring out. Because, I, I mean, some, some people have asked me before, they're like, well, how many times did you do that makeup before you did, you know, you got the one that they wanted? And I said, oh, it could be three, four times. Um, mm-hmm. maybe I got it right on the first shot and they said, really, even now? And I'm like, yeah, even now. <laughs> and I, I will add to that, you know, as a, as a film director and I had Jenna on my set is, you know, sometimes directors are so, I get so focused that my, my pleases and thank yous go out the <laughs> window and it's not that I'm trying to be rude or aggressive or anything like that, but it's like I'm, I'm so focused on what needs to be done and I'm juggling every department on set at the same time that, you know, it's just like, can you get me that? Or look at it. No, that doesn't work. I need you to change it to this. And then I'm gone. And, you know, it's I think maybe it's something that the contest some contestants maybe don't know, but on set, that doesn't mean that they're unhappy with you or that they hate the work. It's just they're so focused. I'll give you a quick anecdote from uh, Tom Woodruff Jr., who was on the Alien set, and they painted the set a different color than they painted the Alien, and they tried to sneak it past James Cameron and stuff it up there anyway, and he said, I could feel James Cameron coming up behind me and just going, no, 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 how is that supposed to blend in with that? And he said, I thought to myself, but we painted this weeks ago, and the set people just... You know, and, and he said, it's a good thing I didn't say that because, man, you know, it's like I was young, but what a stupid thing to say to a director. <laughs> so, you know, there are definitely those aspects to it. Um, but I would also add, like, but, you know, that that's kind of on set criticism. But, there's, you know, I notice in forums and stuff in terms of like, you know, if you go on a practical effects forum, there are uh, there are some artists that love the show, and there are some artists who are you know they're very heavily opposed to the show. Like this doesn't represent us, or you know these mo- these makeups are are too rushed, or blah blah blah. And you know like going back to kind of that criticism, uh, does Face Off overall represent the industry, or should people kind of look at it as uh, it's a competition, not the actual? job or you know what what is the best way to kind of approach that for people who are not in the know well i think that and this is going to be an answer that's annoying i think that it's a hundred percent exactly representative of how the industry works and it's a hundred percent not at all how the industry works i was just about to say the exact same thing yeah i mean there are times where 
was just having a conversation a moment ago with a colleague explaining that I'd worked on a design for a big production, and it was a major character. I worked on it for several months because it had to be right. In the end, it turned out for all sorts of reasons that that design had to be scrapped, and it meant that the design that was still going to be the most major character had to be designed in about a day and a half. So it went from several months to now it's a day and a half. Completely different. Not like a refined nuance in that in a day and a half. Totally different character. So that's, um, from a concept design perspective, that's a face-off reality. But that happens with makeup all the time. You will plan, build, bring to set pieces of foam, silicone, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the director might say, change of plan. We need you to do you know, full alien out of kit. Really? Yep. <laughs> and and you just have to do it. So face off for those who haven't experienced the quote unquote real world, uh, face off gives you some good experience in that regard. And for those who have experienced the real world, you're you're more prepared to uh, be in face off. But I do get why people get upset about face off being misrepresentative of um, the world. And I've heard the ridiculous argument that producers are going to watch this show and they're going to see that makeups can be done in three days and they're going to expect that. Okay, those producers that request that, and this is at risk of those producers never hiring me from this point forward, but those producers don't know what they're talking about. You get what you pay for. You get what amount of time you give people. I can do great design, possibly, given enough time, because I need the time to like process. I'm very capable of doing terrible design, particularly when I don't have enough time to have things kind of gestate and make sense. So if a producer doesn't recognize that quality in, and innovation comes with appropriate amounts of investment of time, which equals money, um, then you're going to get what you pay for. And those producers who are seasoned and experienced and know, they're not going to watch Face Off and go, wait a minute. Now, granted, there's been a couple contestants that have pulled off miracles. And and I, I know that for me, there's been a rare occasion, I'll share with you one story, because it's relevant to this. Uh, when I worked on Prometheus... I was designing a variety of creatures for Ridley Scott and Prometheus. Some of them were taking forever. And the reason it takes forever is because you're looking for it with the director. You're trying to find it with them. And there was one character called Fifield, and I was uh, exploring it with a few other designers. But in the end, Ridley saw that I wasn't getting it. And he's like, you know what, I'm going to pass it on to the London office, see what their take is. And they came up with it. Then there was the engineer. And the engineer, which we'd already figured out what the face looks like, but it was the costume of the engineer. And I had an idea, and that idea Ridley wasn't so keen on me developing initially because he wanted to go a different direction. I said, well, if you don't mind, I'll just do something really quick, see what you think. Woke up early that morning, had kind of a mental epiphany, things gelled. And it was lightning in a bottle for me where it's like, oh, this is working out. Great. And literally in 45 minutes, I'd done a ZBrush sketch, illustration, concept design of the costume. That is the costume in the film. I brought it into Ridley that morning, showed it to him. He's like, oh, my gosh, this is, this is exactly what it should be. I was like, great. I get to work on this for a while. And he says, no, no, we'll just send it. You're done. You did it. <laughs> You've answered the question. And that is not because I am good. And that is certainly not because I can repeat that each time. So, for example, if a producer on Prometheus said, hey, Neville, remember that success you had doing it in 45 minutes? Boy, it would sure save us a lot of money if you could do that every time, please. Yeah. I, I, that was, call it luck, call it having just a, a good morning. It's a variety of things. It, and you, when a face-off contestant does something successful to a producer's eye or to an audience's eye within that crazy time frame, is that something that they can replicate guaranteed? Doubtful. 
Um, and is that something, Jenna, you'd ever want to go through on every single production? You got two and a half days, knock it out of the park, and know that it's going to be under the scrutiny of uh, the viewing public to uh, embrace or not. It's there's, hard. It's there's very, something very hard. about that that you know, I I am the kind of person, and I am not an effects artist. I you know, I I have a certain amount of effects skill. I make weird puppets, kit bash stuff. I'm, I'm known for making things out of cheap materials because I don't know how to make molds and that sort of thing. But as far as I am a producer and I have to come up with treatments to pitch to people all the time. And I, I've noticed some of my best treatments are, you know, it's like I'm lounging in the bathtub or I'm just getting ready to go to bed and then I walk over to the computer and then maybe, you know, it's not a full treatment, but like, a, f a few hours later, there's like really like some of my best treatments have been written that way, and other th projects that I've just given up on and abandoned are, are the ones that I've spent the most time on. And I, and you're right, that doesn't always happen. It, you can flip that, but there is something about I think it's when your brain gets to relax because I think mm -hmm. if you put somebody under the pressure to come up with stuff that is good and fast and on a budget, your brain shuts down. And yeah. I agree. And maybe sometimes I think that some of the best work I've seen on Face Off are, yeah, they didn't have a lot of time. There was that that challenge where contestants were given uh, like three hours to do three makeups and make them kind of uniform. And there was one, it was a see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. Mm, and I remember yeah. Glenn loved it. It was very Hellraiser and it's still one of my favorite makeups I've seen on the show. I mean, it was done on the fly, but I think that was a situation where, yeah, you couldn't repeat that. And I, I forgive me, I can't remember which contestant did that, but I, I was just blown away at the, the simplicity of it and the, just kind of the, the beautiful, easy genius of it, it, for lack of a better word. Yeah, I think for me, I, I have those moments in my dreams a lot. I'll, I'll work on conceptualizing something, and I like it. It's okay, but it doesn't really get me, and then I might dream about it, and then I'm like, okay, yeah, that's it. That's, that's exactly what I need to do. So a lot of mine comes from my dreams. But um, also, I have a, a lot of things that happen that are like almost happy accidents where I'm suddenly out of something, and I have to use something else I didn't intend on using, and it actually winds up turning out better than I had thought. So... Yeah, I think um, that comes up a lot. Yeah, yeah. Are you a are you a big dreamer? Do you dream about things, or do you have epiphanies that come out of necessity, or is it's just kind of, or is there no answer to that? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're talking literally, have I had a dream and then tapped into that creature? That unfortunately is rare, and I have great lucid dreams, but they're not useful to me from a, um, a working standpoint, which makes me so mad because it's like, if you're lucky to have eight hours of sleep, that's eight hours of good creative time that I'm wasting on flying or having <laughs> my, te my teeth coming out or something. Um, but mostly, uh, mostly the way I create is just, it's, it's good, con uh, awake, conscious fantasy. You know, and being able to have dreams while you're awake, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Your your mind relaxes and sometimes takes you places that you wouldn't be able to concentrate and go. You mm -hmm. can't sit there and force yourself to be creative. <clears throat> you kind of have to. But, but at the same time, that is true. But more important than that is the reality of you do not get to work that way professionally. As a fine artist, yeah, you can. As as an artist who decides to do their own creature work, their own ZBrush, their own clay, their own drawing. Sure, you can kind of like take a bath, take a walk, do whatever. But when you're working on a production, that is not a reality. So when they say, we need something in an hour, it's like, okay. And yeah, is, is it going to be great? I don't know. Could be horrible, but that's what it is. You do have details of, from the script, though. You have notes and things that the director needs, so you have that as a foundation to to get started. And I guess you kind of also have a, for lack of a better word, a go-to toolkit of experience that you can apply to that director's needs. Would that be a kind of a correct assessment? It, it is, but it's also a curse. Experience that you can tap into immediately. Uh, and give an answer to an equation is great. 
uh, because it gives you a little bit of confidence that you feel like, I, I can do this. Will it be my best work? Will it be the most innovative? No, but it's going to be a solid answer that works, and that's important. But the problem is that when you're tapping into that reserve, to that experience, you can also, and I'll speak for myself, but I think others will appreciate this, you're going to places that um, you're comfortable with. You're going to, to forms and design choices that you know and, and manipulating them hopefully in new ways. But what you end up with is something that looks like your work, which means it looks like your previous work, which means you're repeating what you do. So then the conversation becomes, well, isn't it great, though, that when you get recognized for your style, nobody ever says to Giger, dude, you keep repeating yourself over and over. It looks like the same old biomechanical crap. No, that's what you want. Yeah. But I know for me, I, I always, I, when people say to me, I saw a creature in a movie and I could totally tell it was you, I'm almost bummed out that I hear that because I want each client, each director who's hired me to get a unique look. Do I succeed? Debatable. Um, but that is my goal. So when people say, I recognize your work, I feel like I've failed because I would love every single piece to be totally unique and appropriate for that director's vision. Well, I think that unique and a style can go hand in hand, though. I mean, it's certainly, like you said, with Giger, you know, people want that style, but he, you know, he he kind of went through all these different incarnations of his art. He abandoned the airbrush and he kept drawing and doing all these sculptures, but it was always his work but uh no I, I do know what you mean though i i would like to get to some questions from uh my listeners here uh mm -hmm. and some of them maybe now uh there is uh burla Bol bolby i think is how you pronounce it uh she says thank you for the opportunity uh, to ask a question i have a quick question for mr page uh, we see that you have done makeup for the Star Trek television show, i.e. Doug Jones. I don't know if you actually do the makeup or, or just the design. Will you continue to do makeup for the show, or was it a one-time event? Uh, and she said she loved the, the design on, on Mr. Doug Jones. Oh, great. Well, thank you, first of all. Um, I am not a makeup artist, and I think a lot of people think that I am, which is flattering um, and then very embarrassing when I have to explain no I if if I applied rouge to someone it would it would be just horrible if I glued a prosthetic down it would be done with super glue so you don't want me <laughs> doing makeup I mean I know um, obviously tricks and techniques and I've learned so much more so that I could be a better designer for makeup um, and when I first I think kind of my first foray into designing specifically for makeup was on the first J.J. Star Trek, working with Joel Harlow. <clears throat> and Joel was also thrown in kind of at the same time as I to where he was involved, but then he became far more involved when we started to design the Romulans together. Because it wasn't just me designing the Romulans and then saying to Joel, okay, dude, I've provided you an incredible design, execute my vision. No, it doesn't work that way. Particularly if I'm not a seasoned, experienced makeup artist. I could propose some things and Joel could say, if you could maybe have the design stop here, it'll make application better, easier, etc. And then I could have a conversation with Joel saying, uh, if you could maybe have your seams land here, it would make the design better. And the consequences, by working together and collaborating, we both, uh, well, I should say we, shouldn't say we, both the makeup artist and both the concept designer could c arrive at something better. Um, so with regards to the TV show, Doug Jones, who I've known for many, many years. Doug's a great guy. <laughs> he is. You know, anyone would want to work with and would be honored to know that they're getting to design something for him. So, you know, to answer Burla, I think the, que the name was... Uh, to answer the question, the Doug I was able to design. I had nothing to do with sculpting his prosthetic, but I had everything to do with sculpting the concept. My choice of medium in this particular um, scenario is digital sculpting because it just is a faster way to be iterative with the client. And Alchemy, 
um, Glenn Hetrick's company, um, they have been doing all of the practical uh, heavy lifting of interpretation of some of my work, sometimes taking it literal when it's necessary. And they will then do all the other stuff that you guys are much more familiar with in regards to makeup design. So because I'm friends with Glenn, because of Face Off, that's why we are friends, actually. I didn't know him before. But because of that relationship, Glenn and I get to have the same type of dynamic that Joel and I had, which um, is a great experience to be able to truly collaborate and design together. And I think just as important... If you get that rare opportunity, and trust me, it is rare, to where you know the actor who's going to be performing in the makeup, and you get to, A, participate with them, what is comfortable for you, what's going to allow you to do your job the best wearing this makeup, but a rare thing, which ironically, a couple hours ago, I was having lunch with an actor who was wearing a design, and we're at a point where we can talk about what the design is for them, how they as an actor can utilize the design the best, and how I can design best to suit their narrative. Because as you know, actors read a script and they think about backstory, who they are, where they came from, and um, they have rarely ever get a chance to say, I'd like my horn to be short, or my horn to be long, or I'd like my color to be this or that. So when you get that extraordinarily rare opportunity to spend time with an actor talk about character development, be in the writer's room, talk about story, um, you get the best product. But that's a very difficult situation to to either ever have or, if you have it, replicate it. Um, speaking of the design, which this kind of leads into the next question, um, and I, I totally know what you mean. I think it's wonderful to kind of make the point that designing is a collaborative process you don't just get to kind of create in a vacuum and I think that's a good thing I I got into movies because I love working with people um, but uh, another listener Jonathan uh, Benta Banta uh, asks please ask him <laughs> what he's uh, what he still does traditionally still drawing with pencil sculpting uh, what what is the medium of choice these days and are there things that if you want to be a designer are just required now? I mean, do you get that choice? Um, so, two-part question. I use whatever seems appropriate for the needs of either the design or the speed of the production because it is all about efficacy combined with a means to articulate your ideas um, as clear as possible. So, for example... Yes is an answer to the question of, do I use pencil? Absolutely. I, I, in fact, I've been starting a lot more projects these days with my basic white paper spiral-bound sketchbook and either a ballpoint pen, because I don't have to sharpen it, or a mechanical pen pencil, because again, I don't have to sharpen it, which means it's something I can have with me at all times, be on the road, and uh, should I be struck with a vision, I can scribble it down. So pencil and paper is critical. And that might be just for a scribble, though. And that's where I've changed lately, is my drawings are less and less interesting to see uh, in terms of like a beautiful Crash McCreary type of pencil drawing or Alan Williams pencil drawing, if you know the people I'm talking about. Those oh, guys are really? phenomenal. So uh, as much as I crave to draw like that, I often find myself not having the opportunity to spend the time. And sometimes it's because of the, the nature of the beast or the projects I um, am involved with. But in the end, it's about... I, I like to make the comparison to building a house. You have to. You're obligated to know how to swing a hammer and uh, pound a nail. Your toolbox is full of various things to assemble wood and frame a home. But it's always, always been about what is the idea, and sometimes the idea means you don't use hammer and nails, it's going to be a, a, a chisel on a mallet, or it's going to be um, carved out of stone. And the same is true of designing an object. If I am tasked with doing 
speaking specifically since it's the face-off uh, episode here, if I'm doing a makeup that an actor is wearing, my preference today in this streamline um, vers- being honest as a designer, meaning that when you do a pencil sketch and it's of an actor wearing a makeup, A, when you show that pencil sketch, it needs to represent as best as possible that actor in that design. So that means that the first thing you've got to be able to do, which is a very specific skill, draw a likeness. Mm-hmm. And then apply your makeup design, your creature design to that likeness. And then you present it and they say, hmm, what's the other side look like? Or that doesn't look like so-and-so actor. And you're like, oh, crap. But it is, I swear to you, it's that actor. Yeah, but I don't really believe you. So for me, what I do is I either try and get a head scan of the actor, which is 99% of the time you don't get. So then what I'll do is sculpt the actor. So Doug Jones in the Star Trek didn't have access to a head scan. So I sculpted Doug and it looked, it was a digital sculpt, so we can do things quicker. Mm-hmm. And on that digital sculpt of him, I then sculpted the design. Point being is that when I went into that meeting with that, I showed the design first in the hopes that people go, oh, cool design. And depending on how that goes, inevitably, a question might be asked of, is that Doug in there? Mm -hmm. And then I can simply use brush later to reduce the makeup or turn off that layer of the design. And you'll see that that is Doug in that design. And then they can decide whether or not they want to dial back how much the actor's buried underneath the rubber so that goes to the second part of the question is which is um i'm paraphrasing but do i need to learn certain skills that are kind of industry standard and i think uh if if you're asking me as a makeup artist it's it, the answer is a touch different than if you're asking me as a concept designer well that that part of let's the question hybridize is it too because i i oh, i do a lot of snuck it in i'm not answering your questions <laughs> It's interesting to me because, um, and it actually leads into the last viewer question that got, um, or listener question that got asked. Uh, I ask that because uh, I, as a as a director and a producer, I don't I don't really have concept designers working for me, and I'm an artist, so I'm constantly scribbling stuff down and handing it to Jenna or whoever, and going, "This is what we're going to do." Um, and uh, you know, usually it's quick, or I'll do it in Photoshop. I'm I'm not a 3D artist. Uh, but it, this actually kind of, I think this is going to lead into what you were going to say. The last question, which is from uh, a listener, Topher Davila. I hope I said the last name right. Uh, Davila? Do you think so? Okay, Topher Davila. I didn't uh, even know you said the first name right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he said he wants to know, he hears you use the term design forms on the show a lot. And he was wondering if you could elaborate what you mean when you say de- design forms. He says you use it a lot, so he wants to get a, a better handle on what that means to you. Um, I certainly don't want to contradict somebody who's saying that I say something often, but I don't actually think I say design forms. I know I've been called out as saying form language a lot, um, which is embarrassing. When That's one of the problems of being on a TV show. You realize, Jesus, I'm a one-trick pony. Is that all I have to say is form language, form language? But it kind of is. So it, whether it's design forms or form language, my education is industrial design. I went to school and got my degree as a product and automotive designer. So one of the jargons that is used, uh, terms, is form language. And I've, I've overused it possibly or simplified it to where it maybe isn't clear enough, which hence the question. Form language is essentially a way to make sure that you have a harmony and a consistency in a vision. So your form language on a character um, can be planar. It's made of flat planes that when these planes meet one another, they create harder edges. And that form language could be referred to as architectural. Or it's really soft spherical forms combined, stacked, and that becomes a very soft, organic form language. So knowing what form language you're t- trying to communicate is clear. Knowing what your your vision is, your core concept, all those things are very, very critical to starting any design because you know where you're going. And we've all sat at a blank canvas or a uh, 
a, a wire armature with a 10 pound bag of wet clay thinking okay what <laughs> will this turn into do I want to do a gorilla-like thing? Uh, maybe I want to do a frog-like thing. I say like because oftentimes design is metaphorical. And so many times we spin our wheels and we get nowhere because we don't have a clear vision of what we want. May so I, oftentimes I before I even started design... Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, I was sorry. just going to say, I, you know, this, is some, this kind of relates to something I was saying on another podcast that I was doing, which is um, I was addressing the issue of... of screenwriters who want to turn their movie into a comic book so they can do a comic book as a proof of concept and get their movie funded and what I wanted what I told them is I'm, I'm a longtime comic book fan uh, you know I was attending Comic Con in the early 90s uh, you know comic books and movies are separate uh, vocabularies uh, and if you want to mm -hmm. convert your movie script into a comic book, you're going to find that you're going to have a vocabulary clash and your, your, your story is going to fall flat in comic books because it's not written for uh, comic books. It's written for a movie and vice versa. You have to figure out how to convert that vocabulary over to get a successful movie from a comic book. Does design, do you feel the design has a vocabulary as well? Is there a specific design vocabulary that... Uh, that that people in the industry speak so that they can kind of uh, maybe pick up on someone's design where someone left off or uh, does that make sense uh it, it does and if you're referring to just how we communicate with one another as designers when you say that that makeup feels a touch too angular or it feels a bit too bio or you love when you get some clients to say to you it just feels a bit too you know just too <laughs> And those proactive. are my favorite critiques of when you're just given nothing to work with. <laughs> yeah, But having the language to actually articulate what it is, is one thing. But then in regards to the object having its own visual language, it's fascinating when you think about it. Because talk about the nuanced difference between a Star Wars alien, Star Trek alien, and a men in black alien. If you are, if you don't know anything about bicycles, I say bicycles because I used to work on designing bicycles. If you don't know anything about bicycles, when you see some of the bicycles that my um, business partner and I had designed, you would look at it and go, okay, so you designed a bike. It's like, what are you kidding? This is so different. It's huge. Mm -hmm. the, the round tube is one and a quarter, not one inch. And that's a massive achievement. So for somebody who doesn't know what we do, they wouldn't be able to discern the difference between a Star Wars, Star Trek, and a Men in Black Alien. But for those of us who are fans of that and do pay attention to it, you will definitely see that there is a language that each of those film worlds has and it has to subscribe to, which is is tricky because how do you write that down? How do you say it in words? And I've had clients say to me, mm, what you're doing is just two men in black. And what that probably means is remove a little bit of the whimsy, tongue-in-cheek cool humor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I and if exactly it's, what you were talking about yeah, it, now. <laughs> when, when you said men in black, right. I was like, whimsical. Those are the words so, used. Yeah, we just spoke the language. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> well... I, I think this is a wonderful, we're, we're just about out of time, uh, so I think this is a wonderful place to wrap it up. We are going to do, uh, and you're welcome to join us, Mr. Page, if you like, we're going to do our uh, Practical People post-show uh, for my Patreon supporters, which is uh, patreon.com slash Christopher Moonlight. Uh, but before we wrap up, we always like to do uh, some shout-outs. Uh, and uh, we invite you to, uh, if there's anyone you'd like to give a shout out to, um, we'd invite you to do so now. Hi, mom. <laughs> that kind of thing. Caught, I caught <laughs> you off guard. Is, is that too much? Because I know that she's not listening she's to the show. Because, yeah. Uh, well, I, uh, God, if I was to do shout outs, you know, if you know me and you follow how I, what I talk about on Facebook, um, it's usually causes. And things that I'm passionate about that have very little to do with the industry other than don't be an ass when you're looking at other people's work. <laughs> so I'm shouting 
not out, but at those who um, need to take pause and take a deep breath and just respect the fact that people are trying their best. Any artist who does anything creative is trying their best. And in, that's all as opposed to Rick um, And other than saying, hi, Mom, mm -hmm. um, I, I would encourage everyone who, who aspires to do what it is that we're very privileged and fortunate to do and that is be creative and be compensated for being creative um, to and I could speak for one hour on this topic alone but just know that there's so much more to life than what we do I mean you're given the opportunity to be a part of this and have the opportunity to have your designs be shared uh, in the public I, because other artists have brought your vision to life um, because people have helped finance the film, the movie, the uh, play that you've been working on. Everything that we do is a privilege and we must take advantage of the opportunity that if you are in the limelight, um, as I've been fortunate to be at times, you've got a great um, show going on, Christopher and Jenna, you clearly are also in the limelight. Mm -hmm. Our responsibility is when you're given a voice, you've got, and this is very Spider-Man, uh, with uh, great power comes um, great, responsibility. great responsibility. I'm not saying I'm powerful, I'm just saying that I recognize I've been given the privilege to have a voice and I intend on using it mm -hmm. in ways that um, are, are more important, dare I say, than making an alien. So, when Amen. people get their get their panties in a wad about uh, my aliens not being good or getting really upset about creature design. And Jenna, you and I have been through um, personal health challenges in the mm -hmm. past and and other friends we've had, you recognize that. And that is that is what life is about. And it's important that you keep that perspective that those are the big issues. So if you're going to get really passionate and you're going to have a diatribe that lasts a couple days on Facebook, I would love that it be applied to something that can make a big difference in people's lives as opposed to um, saying that my Klingon's foreheads are not rigid enough or something. Yeah. <laughs> I love the passion, I love the enthusiasm, but let's, let's take that and apply it to really, really important issues. Oh, wonderful, well, I thank concur. you. <laughs> and how about you, Jenna? Do you, have any, uh, do you have anybody you'd like to do a shout out to? Oh, <laughs> I'm a, you caught me off guard too. Wow. Um, I don't know. I'd really, I'd like to say a shout out to to everybody there on Face Off. Tell everybody I said hello, <laughs> and that that was a, a really wonderful experience to be able to be there. Stressful, but wonderful. Um, and I've taken a lot of the the the, the, con the constructive criticisms to heart, and you know, it's it was a real blessing to be, be to be able to be a part of it. So oh, great. Yeah. Well, I, I'll do a shout out to uh, on uh, on Mr. Page's note. I'll do a shout out to uh, the Indiegogo supporters and uh, who helped finance my movie, The Quantum Terror, as well as my investor, Doug Mayfield, who has turned into not just an investor but a wonderful friend and and helped me to realize the vision behind that movie. So, uh, I, yes, I think it's very important to acknowledge the people who make an investment so whether it be financial or otherwise so that you can create i think that is something that does get taken for granted and uh and it's a very important thing to know so thank you for saying that uh, it's weird to shout out to chris on your own show <laughs> shout out to yourself yeah that's true yeah. Well, you and i jenna will shout out thank you chris um not just really I, I don't have the ego to say thanks for having me on your show. I'm appreciative, but thanks for give, having a platform and creating a platform and putting the energy into giving artists a place to share their experiences and um, a place for other artists who aren't able to be on your show to see that art is celebrated, art is appreciated, and art is achievable 
and that's that's a that's a wonderful thing that you're doing. So well, that's my you. shout out to you, Christopher. Yes, it is. I yeah. appreciate that. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to wrap it up, and uh, yeah, I, wrap ups are always the hardest part for I me, know. especially <laughs> when we get all emotional at the end. Yes, I yes. really appreciate this. Uh, so anyway, uh, to my listeners of the Practical People, uh, whether it be the morning or the evening, uh, whether you be working while you listen uh, or just hanging out, I hope you had a good time listening to us talk, and we'll be back for another episode soon. Thank you, guys.